relationship with God. There hasn't been this when it comes to having a relationship with God. Because it's not just going to church and just saying that I went to church, but it's saying that I went to church and that I received something good for me, that I received something that's going to hold me and catch me and save me and redirect me. Amen. We don't come to church just to say that I'm a Christian and that I go to church faithfully two times, three times, four times a week. So we come to church because we come because we need a fix. We all need a fix. From the greatest to the least, from the youngest to the oldest, we need our share of what God wants to do in our lives. Because if we don't have what God wants to do in our lives, how many of us are miserable? How many of us are just kind of like, man, I, I still feel empty. I still feel like I'm falling short. I still feel like, well, see, when we come to church, it's because we come to receive the goodness of God. We come to receive the word, something that's going to bring encouragement, something that's going to bring confirmation to our lives. And this is why we should be coming to church, praising God, worshiping with our hearts, not because we're, we're all eyes are on us, not because we're focused on, because this is in reality in our hearts to do, whether who's looking and whether who's not looking. At work, in the shower, in the gym, no matter where you're at, people can see if God is really in you. And so this is the life that we ought to live. Because living a life of secrecy, it, it, it causes a lot of headaches. Why? Because you got to do some things in secret and some things in the open, and, and therefore there's no happiness. There's nothing that brings stability. There's a lot of unstableness there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning, we're going to be talking about you have the light that is Christ in you. You have the light that is Christ in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose hearts. Father, we just thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. And we thank you, God, for your spirit, for your faithfulness, my God. This morning, Lord, I just pray, God, that anything that is weighing heavy upon us, Lord, any distractions, my God, that you just deal with it, my God, that you bring in a peace that surpasses all understanding, my God, clarity and understanding of your word. And I pray, God, just help us, Lord, through the changes, through the process, and help us, Lord, just to get a hold of you more and more each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we have this ministry, and even the leaders, even the leaders, the people, everyone that is even within this ministry, but this is Paul speaking, and receive mercy daily. How, do you, how many of you knew that we receive mercy daily? Amen. You don't have, here's your mercy for the week, spend it wisely, right? God is a God of mercy. That means when we mess up the day before, we wake up with new mercy. We wake up with something that we can sort of new again. Lord, help me forget about the past. Help me forgive me for my mistakes. Help me today to become better. Help me today to serve you more wholeheartedly. So this is the type of mercy that God gives us. Why? Because human error runs wild within us at times. That doesn't mean that we can go out and do everything that we want the next day ask for forgiveness. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is that we fall short daily. I'm talking about each and every one of us. We all fall short daily. But as we receive mercy, that we should not lose heart. That means you're still in the race. That means if you're still going to God and seeking God for change, seeking God for, for revival, if you're still seeking God for forgiveness, there's still going to be mercy on you. There's still a chance. There's still a change that is going to happen in your life. See, God is a God that loves to bring changes within us. Amen. How many of us, how many of you have experienced change in your life at one point or another? We all have. From the greatest to the least, we all have experienced God somehow, some way. And through the years that we've experienced, God has had mercy throughout the years that we have even known Him to keep us up to this very point, to call us this very day. Why? Because He has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. 
We're not called here to fill a seat. We're not called here just to say, you know, I'm a member or I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm an attendee. No, you have a purpose in your life. Many of us would not even understand this from time to time, but eventually you would understand the concept. You do have purpose within you. Many of us may have not discovered it just yet, but God will reveal it to you when it's time. Why? Because he doesn't want to scare you. Because I know that one time when I was going to church, I was one of the ones that sat in the very back. I mean, the, the church was long. And I was an usher. And I sat by the door where everyone exits out. I didn't want to be seen, nothing of, nothing of that nature. I just wanted to go to church. But from time to time, pastors would call me up. And then we'll call my wife up, you're called to preach to the nations, you're called to this. I'm like, no, I don't want that. I don't desire that. I didn't understand that. It scared me. So what did I do? I didn't chase it. I ran. I ran for my life. I had, I had to love people. I had to talk to people. No, that was not me. Everyone that has known me, no, that has never been me and never was me. I was scared. Like, God, you want to change me? How much you want to change in my life? Because I, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of wanting to hold on to these areas of my life that I'm comfortable with. I don't need a drastic change. But God ever so lovingly came time and time over and over again because he knew I wasn't willing. He knew I wasn't ready. And eventually he got me. Eventually he hooked it and he set the hook and then he reeled me in. But throughout all those years that I fought God and resisted my calling, resisted my purpose, he has had mercy on me those times. Why? Because there's change. Little change, little something, a little shed of light that was shining more brighter and brighter in my life. See? There's a little bit of light that is shining brighter and brighter in your life, but you may not see it, but God sees it. You don't know how you made it from last week to this week. Why? Because it's God's mercy that has brought you from Monday to Sunday. Why? Because the light that is beginning to shine through in your life. Yeah, Pastor, but I don't feel it. Yeah, sometimes you're not going to feel it. Sometimes you're not going to see it. Sometimes you got to go and just believe that God is with you. See, this is why the Bible talks about faith majority throughout the Word. you got to have faith. The things that are not seen, the things that we must believe in, require faith. And going on verse 2, it says, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Meaning to speak out against, to this own with aversion. Basically to this like, the sin in which we were in, speaking to set what we want on um, speaking the truth. Basically we denounced all these things. We said we no longer wanted these things. No, we no longer desired these things. Renounce the hidden things that have brought us shame. They're not walking in some type of craftiness. They're not trying to walk and trying to convince. But what they're saying is, I'm coming out speaking the truth. No longer living the life that I used to live. No longer giving in any type of, of edification of the things that I used to do. Now speaking against the things that I once thought was right, but now I realize are wrong. Verse three goes on to say, "But even if our gospel is even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds of whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them." And what it's talking about, but even if the gospel is veiled, meaning to hide, that there are going to be those who the, the enemy, which is the devil, has blinded them not to believe. And lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should be shined on them. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. It's 
418 goes on to say, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. Because of the blindness of their hearts. There's many, that, but there's many. I'm pretty sure some of it was us at one point in time in our lives. We don't want to hear the truth. Somebody will tell us about God. We're like, nah, I'm, I'm good. I don't want to hear about your God. Well, God can save you. Well, I'm already feeling pretty safe. Well, God can bless you. I'm already pretty blessed. I got a good job. I got good everything. Well, God can. God is gonna. Uh, is gonna. Only through God you can make heaven your home. Well, I don't need God just right now. But when I'm feeling sick, when I feel like I'm gonna die, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll pray out to Him. Why? Because we were comfortable in the old lives that we used to live. We were comfortable in the things that we were doing. We didn't think that there was a change that was needed to be done within us. There are those that are just not wanting to even understand, to even listen to what even what God is truly about. But then there are some that who want God, but resist and fight it. See, there are some out there that they will not receive the word of God no matter what. But we can't tell who they are, right? We can't tell who they are. But there are some that want God, but they say, you know what, I'm not good. But in the other ear, they're kind of like listening to what you got to say. Their mouths are speaking something else, but they're really listening to what you got to share. They're resistant to what you're saying right then and there. Why? Because they got pride. They got all these things that are going on, their, their life circumstances. But they're truly listening on the other end. This sounds pretty good. But they're just not ready yet. See, there's a difference between the two. We can't judge a book by its cover. We can't tell who's ready. We cannot tell who's ready. But we must, we must know that there are those that are going to pretend to be even hard-headed. Hello? That are going to take it eventually. And God's going to get them where they need to get, be gotten. And then all of a sudden there's a surrender in their life. There's a drastic change in their life. All of a sudden, they're able to love people. All of a sudden, they're able to have conversations. All of a sudden, you see a difference in their lives. You see growth. You see maturity. The pride begins to fall down. The Everything else that, 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 that becomes and resists God begins to come down. Why? Because they're surrendering to God. They're giving God their all. They're remaining unhidden and showing God everything that they have within their hearts. Verse 5, it says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Nobody wants to hear about us. Nobody wants to hear about you and all that you can do. Oh, I do this, I do that. Uh, this. No one wants to hear that. They want to hear about God. Because sooner or later you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna put a sick taste in the taste buds. They're gonna see you react and act a certain way. Nobody wants to hear about what you are, but they want to hear about the God that's in you. This is what people want to hear. This is what's gonna draw people. It's not what you do. It's not how you speak. It's not how you pray. It's not what kind of positions you have. It's none of that. But it's the God that is in you. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. No, that's God within you. It's not you. Get that pride. Re rebuke that pride. You're not doing it. God's doing it. See, we have to understand in all things that God gets the glory. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Thank you, Lord, for having your anointings on me. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a voice to speak. For giving me words to say. Why? Because it's those words that people can hang on to, that people can trust. It's your words, God, that will live forever within their hearts. It's your words, God, that can bring change into their lives. It's your words, God, that are anointed, not mine. We're just a vessel. We're just a vessel carrying Jesus within our hearts, who is a light. And the light is shining from through us which is in Christ. 
as we have the light, as we have his word, give that to everyone who listens. Sharing in the knowledge of God. Sharing in the knowledge of God. Why? Because our answers, our opinions, everything will change from time to time. It'll only help for so long. But if it comes from the word of God and you lose where you're going with it, all you have to do is go back to it Find another verse to back up what you just said. That's going to give someone else that understanding of, I still have opportunity. I still have chance. I can still do this. This is why the Bible is the book of life. Because it gives life. It talks about our life. It talks about all our life troubles, our life issues. Yeah, but it's hard to understand. Uh, I know it can be at times. But when the Spirit of God grows more and more evident in your life, and you begin to read, it becomes more alive. It changes you. Yeah, but reading is boring. Well, if you want salvation, you got to read your word. If you, gotta, if you want to understand how God works, you got to read your word. If you want to know well, how to get out of situations, you got to read your word. It tells you everything in here. I used to be one of those ones, well, it takes too long. Tell me a scripture. Show me a scripture. Give me something to help me right now. I was draining everyone's spiritual tanks. <laughs> By the time I was done with everyone, they were all probably on empty, asking the Lord for mercy. Because I want answers. I want direction now. I need something to help me sleep tonight. Give me something. Give me something to rest my mind upon. Give me something so I don't have to worry about this no more. I'm going to send a group message, send it individually to 20 people so I can get some type of confirmation, which I probably will never get. But when I go to the Word of God and I pray on it and I read it, there's my confirmation right there. That's how powerful God is. That's how powerful God is. Verse 6, it says that, For it is God, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that is within us, that is the light. And we carry that light. So now we are able to share to those that we come into contact with. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. That it may be of God by God's presence alive within us. Verse 8, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I want to look at Psalms 31. You don't have to turn. There's Psalms 31, verse 23. Oh, love the Lord, all you, all you his saints. For the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. For he reserves the faithful and fully pays the proud person. That means if you are faithful, he's going to keep you. If you, are, if you are faithful, if you are, if you are pursuing God, He's going to keep you. If there's someone that's trying to interfere in your life, if there's someone that is trying to bring you down, if there's a group that is trying to destroy you, God will repay them. God is your vindicator. It is no longer you. It is no longer the lightning. It is no longer the thunder. Right? It's no longer this no more because many of us love throwing these. But it's no longer this any longer. It's God that is our vindicator that fights for us. Why? Because if we, throw, if we decide to throw it down one day, guess what? That person you've been testifying to is going to catch you. And you're like, oh, that's what you're really about. And everything has just gone down the drain. Your testimony, everything that you have spoken about God, they're going to say, you know what? You're just like me. Verse 10. It goes on to say, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. See, as we have Christ in us, he keeps us by showing himself. 
He keeps us by showing us up. He will not allow himself to fall. He will not allow himself to fail. So if you have Jesus in your heart this morning, if you have Christ within you today, you're not going to fail. You're not going to fall. You're not going to fall face first. You're not going to walk into a brick wall. And if you do, you're going to bounce right back up. Why? Because Jesus will not fail you. He may allow you to feel that pain if you decide to walk into that wall. <laughs> Have you learned your lesson yet? No, I haven't. You walk again, right? But at the end of it, how God kind of picks you back up and he dusts you off. And he says, now, have you learned your lesson? Now, let's go. Let's move on. See, this is the way that God works. When he's within our lives, when he's within our hearts, we may feel like we fail. We may feel like we fall short. But it's Christ that's in us that renews us, that continues to give us the mercies that we need so that we can carry on and pursue him wholeheartedly. Why? Because sometimes when we mess up, we feel like, man, we just screwed up totally and it's really nothing big. Maybe like it was just something very small, but we feel like we screwed up past the biggest groups ever. But then God is in our hearts saying, look, we can get past this. Look, I forgive you for this. Repent. Come back to me. And let's go. Because sometimes we can be our worst critic. We can look in the mirror and say, I should have done better. I should have known better. Yeah, we should have. We could have. But don't let the enemy come in and drag you through the mud. Then God come in and allow Jesus Christ that is within you restore you. And get out of that, that, that thinking of, I'll never amount to anything. Or I'll never do anything that's right. See, that's just the enemy that comes in to try to deceive us. But God is faithful. Going on verse 11, it says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Death is always working in us, but life in you. How constantly we die to the flesh. Constantly dying to the flesh. So that Jesus can be manifested for us spiritually, helping us get to life. See, in order for God to work in us, we have to continue to die to the flesh. We have to continue to give God something that is part of us that is not good for us. Because there are some things that we want to hold on to that we think are okay, but in reality they're not. They hold you back from experiencing God to the fullest. Even though we may think that it's something small and it's not really messing with you. But if that's the case, then why are you having a hard time giving it up? It's not that small. It's not that great of a sin. But God's dealing with you. So why is it so hard to let that one thing go? If it's not really a big thing. Because sometimes in our minds we kind of belittle things and say, you know what, it's not that it's not that big of a deal. Well, if it's not that big of a deal, well come on. Give it to God. I could live without that and give it to God. This is all that He wants. Why? Because He's waiting. He's probably having a breakthrough prepared for your life. He's just waiting for that one thing that you give up. Why? So that you can be able to experience whatever that break the risk fully without anything in your life holding you back. See, the way that God works in us and works for us is that, hey, we give a little and he takes a little and then in return he gives us what we need. He recycles our sin and he gives back righteousness. He recycles our sin and he gives back something that's going to help carry us.
So death is working in us, but life in you. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Verse 13, it says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raises up the Lord Jesus will also raise up with Jesus and will present us with you. I want to read this scripture and send Romans. Romans chapter 4. Verse 20. It says, He did not wave the pro at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what He had promised, He was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him for righteousness. We should be getting excited when we see God working in our lives. When we come to worship, and we're praying and we're worshiping God, it's not a time, it, worship is not a time to just feel emotional. It's not a time of, 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 of worshiping God and, and saying, I'm feeling good. It's not about feelings. It's about worship. It's about coming to the presence of the Lord. Coming in in a, in a heart of thankfulness. Coming in a heart of gratitude. It's not about looking at, at the words on the screen. That's not about keeping up with the, with the worship team. It has nothing to do with that. Worship is coming into a place of worship. That means giving our whole heart. That means worshiping with our heart unto the Lord. Giving God praise for everything that he's done in our lives. Sometimes we can take this so lightly. Sometimes we can see God moving just a little and we're just saying, oh, well, God's doing something. No, God is doing something great that you could not do yourself. Well, I'm starting to see something change. I believe that, that God's doing something. Well, praise God. Don't just, oh, I, I believe that God's, I, but I, God is doing something. It's something small, but I know he's gonna, it's going to lead to something great. We tend to turn something great into something small. We stay self-preserved so that people will, cannot see the excitement in us. Why? Why? If God's moving in your life, be excited about it. I tell you one thing, I don't always talk about it. I had so many things going on at work. So many things going on. I would go home and I just could not think for the life of me. My head was in the clouds for months. I thought nothing was ever going to end, but God is finally moving. That something that I could not do. My position, my authority, my power, nothing meant nothing to me on my job site. Nothing means nothing. It doesn't mean nothing in this world. But when God decides to move, to God be the glory. Well, Pastor, you look a little excited at that. Who cares? Who cares? I'm not called to be like anybody else. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be excited and you don't like it, I'm sorry. We got the children's church in there. It's okay to be excited. It's okay to say God's moving. I'm thankful for this. I needed this breakthrough. And my family knows I needed this breakthrough. I needed God to move. Man, God, why is it taking so long? It's already been too much. You see where my mental state is at? You see where my mind is foggy? 
You see what I can barely think? You see when I read your word, I'm trying to make sense of it. I don't understand it. I still got a job to do. I don't have to only work, but I got to do your word. I got to do the ministry. I can't do this. What is going on within my mind? Sunday comes up. Lord, I don't know what this even means. I've studied it. I've read it. I've got notes. I know what you're saying, but I don't get it still. God moves every service. God speaking every service. How? I don't know. I don't know. God's doing it. Praise God. Why? Because even after that, I feel refreshed. I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to myself. I'm preaching to myself because I need it. I need the breakthrough. I need the change. I need it. But see, no one knew this. Only my family did. Only my family did. And this is why I can say you got to believe in God. This is why I say you got to have faith in God. This is why I say the only thing that you can do is trust in God. Because when you feel like everything's been ripped from you and you can't do nothing, what else do you have left to do? Everything else that you turn to has failed you. What are you going to do? Turn to it again and see if it's going to fix it this time? It didn't work the first time. It didn't work the second time. It didn't work the third time. And you got God over here, and you're like, I'm right here. Hello? And like, I know I see you, God, but I have this other thing I want to try first. <laughs> and you go and try it, and it doesn't work out. It fails. And God's still like, man, come on. I'm knocking at the door of your heart. But yet, you have not answered. You have not opened the door to let me in. We can get excited about football games. Can we? I'll tell you what. Yeah, go, yeah. Come on, touchdown, yeah. Right? Sometimes we have our voice and we're like, yeah, it was a good game on Sunday. I could barely talk. I was yelling for my team. I was cheering my team on, but I could barely talk. If we had the same excite me when it came to God. Can you imagine how much more God will move in your life? Why? Because you're so busy giving God the glory everywhere. And he's like, you know what? I can use that mouthpiece right there. I'm going to do something in their life. Why? Because they're going to go and they can't shut up about me. And people are telling them like, ugh, why do you got to keep talking about God? I'm going to use that person right there. I'm going to use that person that continues to Lift up my name. The one that continues to, to give me the glory. Oh, Lord. Hello. I, I hope I can be that one. I hope I can stay consistent in that area because it's hard. See, consistency is a bad word. No one likes consistency, right? Because we, want, we, we like to say, we like to hear, well, if you pray this prayer, it'll be fixed. Or if you believe in God for this, it'll be done, it'll be over with, and you don't have to worry about it no more. Or this or that. We want the one-step rule, the one-step process. But see, we have to be consistent. We have to stay on the same direction. We have to stay on the same road as God. We can't deviate. We can't turn. We can't do a U-turn. Consistency is one of the hardest things to do in Christianity. Going on verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. All the glory for God. And verse 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose hearts. Therefore we do not lose hearts. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
day by day our inward man is being renewed. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, it goes on to say that, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God and in, in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> The one thing I like about the scripture right here is again, therefore, we do not lose hearts. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. See, this right here, even God was speaking to me this morning, is that even though we're getting older, the man with the person that's within us. The inward man is being renewed day by day. Because sometimes we come to this place of, well, I'm already this, this of age. Yeah, we all are going to get older. There's no fountain in youth. There's, no, there's no, nothing that's going to reverse time. But as we grow older, and our, our mentalities and, and everything within our hearts are growing old with, with us. So when the Spirit of God comes within our hearts, then it makes us new. As we're growing older, God is doing something different in our lives. God is doing something new in our lives. As we're getting older, God is bringing a freshness within our spirit. God is changing us in the way that we think. God is changing us in the way that we are. As we're getting older, we're still being renewed within, spiritually. God is still doing something great. God is still, still doing something awesome. See, it doesn't matter what age you start when you serve God. It doesn't matter how young. It doesn't matter how old you are. God that is within you is going to bring the newness into your life from within not from the outward. Because sometimes we think, you know what, we're too far gone. Yeah, on the outward, but God is work into working on the inside. He's into working on the heart issue. He's into working on the things that really burden you. He's into working on the things that hold you back. Because I, I don't want to grow young, and I don't want to stay young. The, 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 the longer I do that, the longer I have to stay in this world. Uh huh. Let the years keep going by. I want to see God soon or, or later. But even though as we age, God will always give us the strength that we need to do His will. He'll always give us the strength to do His will. Verse 17, it goes on to say, For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. While we do not look at these things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Everything that we face in life, it teaches us to grow everything in life. There's, there's no, well, this and that. Everything in life that we experience, it teaches us to grow. It teaches us to, to be able to experience. It teaches us to be able to understand. We all have a life that we live separately away from church. We all have different experiences in life that many of us may not have or have maybe a liking to it, a similar similarity to it. But I remember when I was at my cousin's funeral this past, like two weeks ago, last week, last week on Friday, and the pastor that was doing it Pretty simple, laid it out there, pretty simple. We're all gonna die one day. Death is inevitable. It's gonna happen. My cousin was a year and a half, I believe, 
older than me. So he was, he was still fairly young. My cousin was, didn't have all his health going on, but yet he was still a fighter. He was in a hospital for five months, right? And the one thing is, I'm gonna share this. The one thing is with that, is that there are many prayers that were going for him, and there are many things that were coming against him in his health. His lungs were shriveled up, and they were becoming crystallized. And the doctor said, you know what? It's not going to happen. He's not going to survive after, after a surgery or after this and that. The doctors were saying, it's not going to work out, but we're going to do it. And the wife was like, no, he is going to survive, and he is going to make it through it. And so he went through procedures, he went through surgeries, and every single time he came out, every single time something was, was coming out positive, every surgery, he had probably like three surgeries maybe or four, but every surgery, every, everything that they seen about his lungs and everything, there was always something bad. But then his wife was there, who's a believer, was saying, no, he's going to make it through, or he, this is going to happen, this is going to take place. And lo and behold, things were taking place. Things were happening that the doctors could not understand. The doctors could not even believe, even though they were to ask after a couple times when they would work on him. And she would say, well, how did that happen? And they would start doing this. They started becoming believers. They started knowing that there was a higher authority rather than their own selves. Their own thinking was like, it won't happen. But God was, had something else planned. And, and, and had something else planned. God was doing miracles through my cousin. Even though the end result was death. God used him because his wife was speaking words of faith. She was being used as a mouthpiece. So God was using my cousin to perform miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle that even the, the people that have taken care of him were even believing that it was a higher authority. And even though the end results he ended up passing away, his passing away, God was glorified in that. Well, how can you say that that was God? There was believers that came from it. Why did God take them? I don't know. It's it's God. It's God's decision. It's not mine. I I, I question it at times. Why? 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 But ultimately, it came to a place of you know what, God, you know way better than me. Why should I be selfish and holding on to something that I have no understanding over? Was there something in his life that he was going to have to face? that was going to be much more worse for him, that he would not have the opportunity to even experience me through that. Because I believe that even through that, that when the doctor said, you know, that he could not hear nothing, brain dead, whatever the case may be, that he was still having reactions. His daughter was singing and he was still having reactions. He was still doing the winking eyes. He was still doing all the stuff that he wouldn't normally do, even though the doctor said that he wasn't really there. See, even when we're close to that state of mind, even though we are close to death, we still have opportunity to let people know that God is real. And in that, it took faith for her to say, he's going to make it through. It took faith for her to speak that God's going to do it. And because of that, because of staying persistent, there were believers from that hospital there are many that were close to him. Many that have fought for his life. See, and all of this, that helped me understand that even in the midst of the things that we go through, there's some type of miracle that is taking place that we may not see as a miracle. But if we go back and we look at some certain things in life, that there was a miracle that had taken place that we may have not even acknowledged for ourselves because we have been blinded by something else. We all, we all want to make heaven our home. This is a reality home, right? Whether, whether a sinner, whether this or not, we all like the thought of heaven. 
We all like the thought of making heaven our home. Whether you're not serving God or whether you are, heaven sounds like a place I want to be. It sounds like a place I want to spend the rest of my life in. And I know that there are many out there that are believing that, you know what, I want to make heaven my home. But we have to remember it was God who created both heaven and earth. It was God that put the stars into the sky. It was God that created all the animals. It was God the creator of all things that was the one that created heaven and earth. And this is why we need to have faith in Him. Because if we don't have faith in Him, then how can we expect to make heaven our home? That's a tough, that's a, that's something tough to chew on. If you don't have faith in God, then what can you say for have, making heaven your home? That's a harsh reality. It, it, it's pretty tough when you say it that way. But how can you expect to make heaven your home if you can't have faith in God? Or if you don't want to believe in God or if you don't even trust in God? Don't get me wrong. God has mercy. God has grace on whoever he wants. On whoever he wants. See, that's the way that God works. And that's pretty awesome. That's pretty fantastic. I, I, I love that about him. Why? Because he gave me so many years. He gave me so many years to be able to come to that place of, you know what, Lord, forgive me. But we need to have our faith in God. For these times, these days are getting crazy. And we have nowhere else to run. The banks carry so much money of ours that we put into gas nowadays. Our stakes that cost 15 bucks are now 30 bucks. You know how they used to have parties and used to have like the drinks and used to bring your cup or now they say, you know, BYOB, bring your own drink or whatever the case may be. Nowadays, barbecues are like, well, bring your own meat. You know, bring your own drink, bring your own something because I can't afford to feed all of you anymore. But see, God, God still is our, God is still the one that gives us provision and supplies us our very need. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your word. I pray, God, that this morning that you can...